Some friends in Ooh, welcome to the new position. Some friends in Berlin have been watching it. So. Well, go right the way around and all over. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah welcome, oh, thundercloud. Boom! There's lots of that around at the moment, isn't there? Oh, yeah. Lightning, thunder, pouring rain. The old name my mum calls me James here at the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame in Gyra. Welcome to the participants, the audience, and the people out there in Facebook and YouTube and our, all around the world. Hello from little humble Gyra. Let's begin with acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, the First Nations, Kamilaroi and Banbai here in Gyra, and the continuing connection to the land of the elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded. On that, I'm going to start with uh, Kevin Gilbert's poetry. You know, Kevin Gilbert was a Wiradjuri man, uh, born in 1933 and passed in 1993. Um, he was of the stolen generation and he escaped the orphanage and grew up with his extended uh, family by the river and he spent time inside and that's where he started writing. And he was, um, this one's called, this book's called Child Dreaming that I'll be reading out of. And there are some little short pieces of poetry, just quite train some of them. Um, it was published in 1992, just one year before he passed. Emu and Koori. When Captain Cook wrote his, wrote his seafaring book, how could he have been so silly? To think he discovered Australia before Emu and the Koori. Okay. Yes, this one's not a, exactly a quatrain. Um, it's called Little Paw Print. Here's someone's little paw prints, whose I do not know, carved upon the desert sand in a lovely sculptured row. And is that hole an antlion's nest? Or some small dry desert beast that little poor prince tried to find to make a dinner feast? <laughs> so, no need to clap if you don't want, because these are just cultural quatrains from now on until I finish at the end. Turtle. Turtle likes to travel far, his home upon his back, much better than a caravan or a holiday shack. Yeah. 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 It's all right. yeah, that's good. It is, yeah. You can relate to that. I can you relate, can relate to, that. to that. Yeah. I saw Big Eagle watching me while he sat on the old gum tree. I thought, I'm glad I'm as big as me and not as big as Finch. <laughs> <laughs> desert P. I stared hard at the desert P. He'd had two eyes, it was plain to see. I blinked and then winked and then stared again, but it didn't blink back at me. Desert Orange. The Desert Orange is hard to find and it's harder to climb the tree. The fruit is good, its skin is green and full of vitamin C. <laughs> and Wood Spider. I am Wood Spider. <laughs> I have eight eyes. <laughs> it's true. One to look at magpie, one for kangaroo, one 
for Jerry Jerry, Giro, an old man emu, two for my pog in the night, and one to wink at you. <laughs> yeah. Read that again. I am Wood Spider. I have eight eyes. It's true. One to look at magpie, one for kangaroo, one for jiri jiri, girol, an old man emu, two for mopok in the night, and one to wink at you. It's a bit more than cute, isn't it? Yeah. Wallabies, we've got wallabies up here. Um, this is a, the picture that goes with this is a wallaby in the snow. Wallabies, like me, cannot ski or go for a toboggan ride. We get cold feet from the snow and the sleep. So we find a rock cave and we hide. Alright. <laughs> now, before we move on tonight, um, I've got a die, just one of them here, and I've got the name Steve, Doug, Ashley, Bill, Mark, Gladys, and Paul as number seven. But um, anyway, uh, rolling the dice, number two comes up. Doug, Doug, you're going to be coming first tonight, so you'll go first. Yeah, and then I'll roll the dice again, and you got a two again. Well. Wow. Um, it's uh, another two. It's a oh, 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 no. oh, no. oh, no. oh, no. no. Come up for um, you can be very sophisticated. Yeah, very sophisticated. Anyway, this is this is by an anonymous poet who we're not too sure where it's come from, but it's called the it's by the High Plains Nobbit, and it's called. The loose curse. What do I do when you do too? Loose talk curse through point of view. Salty sea talk, name in vain, raisins, Hades, raisin, cane. Words like daggers, words like guns, dopey cliches, mindless puns. Vile expletive, loose tongue call, stuff your eyeballs, stuff you all. Holy Christ and holy hell, demons listening, you've done well. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's mm. All right. And... Good day, Professor. How are you going? We got it. I've moved up in. And you? Wisdom has come. All right, so with that, I'm going to invite Doug on up to come and do some of his wonderful poetry. Doug, now, Doug got up here quite early today, about 4.30, and he's been working away in Seahorse Medicine Cafe, writing poetry. Yeah, so, I'm going to screw it. Oh, no, it's never screwed up. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, wonderful. Well, well, even you blow yourself here. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Doug. Um, shall I call this a breath of sanity when I come in on Wednesday night? I call it a breath of sanity because I've been exposed to a bit of stuff in the last few days which doesn't appeal to me as sanity anyway. I come in and I get a breath. Thank you. Uh, and do a little bit of preamble to this. This is about a, a visit out to the National Park last Monday, out from Glen Innes, out to, uh, what's it called, um, Gibraltar area. Um, and I'll just preamble quick, because I got a lot of memories of that place. My kids and I would go there regularly when they were at school, still at school, and yeah, lots of memories. And also going there, I've been reminded by people and I. Now you have done welcome to country, yeah? Or anyway, 
I just know that different ones have said to me over the years, a very important Aboriginal location. How the hell would I be so arrogant to interpret that? But I've heard that. Don't worry, walks up there and they, I just muse about what it must have been like 200 years. So please don't see, I mentioned Aboriginal a bit here, but please, from my own perspective, don't interpret it as white arrogance. Okay, here we go. Well, I made all the apologies, so it's got to be good. Um, <clears throat> on Monday last, we went out east into the National Park. A day of beauty, summer warmth, the scent so strong, so gentle, too. <clears throat> the invite was from way beyond. Dark world voice was gone. The place was wrapped in magic vibe. My memories grabbed me fierce and sad. My own loss of family time. Old Boundary Creek flowed fast that day down waterfalls so tall. A pond below holds content pure. To drink and bathe was vital. Sawmill remnants showed amongst the green of new growth lush. Weathered stumps across the gully could not be ignored. I muse this scene from way back whence. The cedar, the cedar drew us white intense. A cedar tree, gun barrels straight, their overstories skyward. Strong men toiled to move these elders from their safe bush home. The forest on the run, exclamation mark. I drifted mindful of this place so many years ago. Non-cedar, gums in bracket, from way back when still live and breathe, exist, still here. And 200 years behind us now, a black-skinned family watched, I guess. Relations disappearing, ancient stories, sacred ties so quickly severed, crying with dismay. Nature's needs were toppling, crashing, souls were forced away. These tribal dwellers living, thriving amongst these grand old friends drew breaths quite sharp and sh shouted as they watched the white man busy. Tears showed clear. Their instinct shot to pieces. Whatever. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, now, after this one, <coughs> which is called the Bowerbird, are you right to give, uh, come on up, Bill? I certainly am. Okay, we've got a, a new <coughs> poet here that we're going to tonight, Bill from Tasmania. Yeah. Where's that? So that's down there somewhere. Ah. Mm. Yeah, the bottom end. Yeah. Uh, this one's uh, the Bowerbird, and I did this in the 2017 Nimbin Performance <coughs> Poetry me. World Cup as part of my performances. Um, yeah. <coughs> this one came into my head from Arnie Pat's niece, who said, Arnie Pat, it makes me mad. Some people are like Bowerbirds, and that's sad. The bowerbird is not your mate. He'll take and take, take and take. He hoards away the gold and blue, the junk, the mask, 
attracting you. He builds a house of straw and sticks and full of junk and plastic bits. A satin bowerbird, electric blue, pegs and pens and lighters, two bits of rope and plastic lids, garbage dropped by little kids. A regent bowerbird is no better gold and yellow plastic treasure hoarding for a rainy day. When floods, a calm wash ship away. Collecting stuff, attracting mates, making babies and then out the gate. No love there in plastic treasure. The bower bird's not so clever. It never used to be this way, collecting plastic junk each day. The bower birds once knew better, collecting flowers and fruits as treasure. But now they're buried in a mound of plastic. Mm. The bow birds just so tragic. Mm. 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 Well, Bill, please, Bill from Tasmania, welcome. Thank you. I'm driving down south. That's green. Real grain. I'm with this old man, I look at him and it doesn't occur to me whether I'm dreaming. And we drive along this dirt road for a while and he turns off. And then he turns off again and we pull up at this house. He gets out of the car, he walks toward the house and I don't know what I'm meant to do so I open the glove box. It's empty. So I get out and look and there's a ancient tennis court with a saggy net and on the rusted winder there's a large blue butterfly. To my left there's a huge bird that lazily flaps into the sky that's the colour of an old hippie's faded Levi's. I get a, the old man comes out of the car. He's wearing overalls with a red neckerchief. He sits down on the grass and I sit down beside him. Out of his pocket, he pulls out a meerschaum pipe and stuffs it with tobacco and fills the air with pungent smoke. He says he's got some bad news. And I look at him and he says, I'm sorry, my wife has contagious amnesia. And I lie back on the grass and look at the clouds. Man, it's a lovely day to forget everything. <laughs> <laughs> if ever you come to Gyra and you're walking down the street, you might see an old man in an old pinstripe jacket and he's clicking a pen and he's mumbling to himself in a language that only 19 people in the world understand and would recognise and only six people speak. And he might smile at you and extend his hand as if you were his friend, but don't take his hand. You really don't want to be his friend. No, you really don't want that. Okay, thank you, Bill. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Really cool. yeah. yeah. Welcome to the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame. That's, that's a great first yeah. off premiere yeah. performance here. Now, I didn't roll the dice. Um, we ended up with a three, which is Ashley, but Ashley's fallen asleep in the no, couch. No, no. Before, before Ashley comes up, this is one that I wrote, so we'll give you time to get up. Um, one in, I decided to go back into my 2019 poetry um, archive and found this one called Aberrant Zoolander and it's um, an A to Z um, just sort of going through the um, alphabetical order going through the thesaurus this is what came out um, and Gabriel you're going to have a read tonight too? Yeah I do, I do. Excellent so this is uh, what came out and it's called Aberrant Zoolander. 
and it's alphabetical order. Oh, it's probably time I, I just, so I'll give a language and concept warning as well for it. Um, yeah. Language and concept warning. Ding. Ding. Okay. <laughs> Turn off, kitties. Go away and go and run away and do something like play with your dollies and cars. Aberrant, abhorrent, abusers, addressed as Aboriginal boys, beaten, bashed, benediction, be blessed. Catholic canons, cardinals, chamber, confessed, corruption, crime, corporate crown, cult of the crest. <laughs> circumcised, castration, conspire to create captives of case law, no cause to celebrate. Dawn of the dead, a determined defence. Don't disobey, dinky die, deputy, dense. Dubious dynasty, Elizabethan excellence. Economic enslavement, employment experiments. Farewell, fate, forces, fatherless, foster child, fair dinkum, failure, find future. Fucking fry. Fugitives, funerals, forlorn in frustrations, gymnasiums in jails for genocide generation. Hard up, he's hanging, head high in heaven, hostages <laughs> of holy human incarceration, hurting, humiliated. How is his alley? Hits her, hit her hatred. Hits heroin, hits ice as well, incalculably incapacitated, indebted, intimidation, jostled, just jailed, judge, jackass, jurisdiction. <coughs> Kleptomaniacs with keys and knives, knowledge of law, lawyers masquerading as merchants misappropriate more. Macquarie merchant money man's mates misappropriate much, much more. Murderous militiamen masturbate to militarism. Newspaper, no true news, narcissistic nationalism. Nihilistic nightmare, nationalist necrophiles. Orchestrates oligarchy, orgies of obedient pedophiles. Prime Minister Patriot, pickpocketing poor President Pandemonium pays for prostitutes and porn. Pulpit provocation of the priest pederast plebiscite and praying for peace. Psychotic psychopaths. Queer Queensland QCs read Royal Commission reports, racist recommendation, recommendations, recognised as good at sports. So suck shit, shut up, Sergeant Stupid Snort, Sniff, Squeal, Snout. State slavery sucks. Our son's suicide. Scream, shuffle and shout. Terrorist theocracy. Terrorist theocracies, tentacles, trick, television, telephones, touch screens, totalitarian trip, twats, in tuxedos, unsecured, unemployed, usurp, utopian visions, very vaporised, walkabout, welcome, water lilies, wetland, Xantheria, Yabbies, you live in Zooland. It's a magic one, that one, isn't it? Ooh, ooh. Do, 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 do. Um, I'm going to follow on, Ashley. <laughs> well, listening um, so to that listen. last poem. <laughs> reminds me of a conversation I'm about to have with James about the bad behaviour of some boys at Moolumba High School in the late 1960s involving Brisbane and all that that is in that poem. 
uh, an advertisement for the Hall of Fame, Poets Hall of Fame. This is not blank. <coughs> James has carefully crafted these uh, posters that we buy and stick up on our fridges and walls and hopefully uh, school alleyways someday, <coughs> telling the story of Australia because we come to Gyra to remember. Um, I will read two poems that I got serendipitously, is it, off the desk there, and it struck me that they really are coins of Australian consciousness. The first one is by Les Murray, very famous work he wrote called um, Rainwater Tank. And having spent some time in the Aboriginal world, W-H-I-R-L-D as well as W-O-R-L-D, I can feel that he had a um, closeness to some strands of that in the, the woof of it. I don't think he had much of the warp of it, but he had the woof of it, living in the bush down there at Gloucester. Uh, rainwater tank. Empty rings when tapped give tongue, rings that are tense with water talk as he sounds them Ring by rung, Joe Mitchell's reddened knuckles walk. The cattle dog's head sinks down a notch and another notch beside the tank, and Mitchell's boy, with an old jack plane, lifts moustaches from a plank. From the puddle that the tank has dripped, hens peck glimmerings and up tilt their heads to shake the quickness down. Petunias live on what gets spilt. The tank stand spider adds a spittle thread to her portrait of her soul. Pencil grey and stacked like shillings out of a banker's paper roll. Stands the tank. Roof water drinker. The downpipe stairs drought into it. Briefly the kitchen tap turns on, then off. But the tank says, debit, debit. <laughs> Uh, very, it's a very famous poem, that one, a very famous poem, generated a lot of commentary. And uh, it's got that feeling of mud and earth that uh, is complete in itself and doesn't need any um, lotus to rise up out to go pop in the sunlight. It's uh, completely muddy, Mr uh, Murray's poem, uh, Rainwater Tank. The other one I found on the desk tonight uh, is called Tiger by Alex Derwent Hope. And it struck me reading it three or four times before this chortle effort. It struck me that uh, it's very typical of a world of fantasy in Australian song and ballad and uh, story that is underplayed in the way we look at ourselves. Um, I thought of the great Hal Stivens as I read it a second time, and then of course I thought how little known he is relative to the wonderful things he did on the horizon, Mr Stivens. He was better known in Czechoslovakia than he was in Australia. But this poem of hopes reminded me of uh, that world of fantasy that all humans have, but Australians have in their way, and this is the way of it. There are three tigers, I presume. Tiger. The paper tigers roar at noon. The sun is hot, the sun is high. They roar in chorus, not in tune. Their plaintive, savage, hunting cry. Oh, when you hear them, stop your ears and clench your lids and bite your tongue. The harmless paper tiger bears strong fascination for the young. His forest is the busy street, his den's the forum and the mart. He drinks no blood, he tastes no meat, he riddles and corrupts the heart. But when the dust begins to creep, from tree to tree, from door to door, the jungle tiger wakes from sleep and utters his authentic roar. It bursts the night and shakes the stars, till one breaks blazing from the sky. Then listen, if to meet it soars your hearts, 
reverberating cry, my child, my child, then put aside your fear, unbar the door and walk outside, the real tiger waits you there, his golden eyes shall be your guide, and should he spare you in his wrath, the world and all the worlds are yours, and should he leap the jungle path and clasp you with his bloody paws, then say, as his divine embrace destroys the mortal parts of you, I too am of that royal race, what, who do what we are born to do. And I think you meet this to hope in that poem. Mm -hmm. He was very much like that kind of. <coughs> Thank you, Ashley. Um, Thanks for the post. All right, Mark, would you like to come on up? Yes. Okay, Mark Spencer. You can... Yeah. I'm going to make an apology first, and that's because not being a German speaker, I'm that's going to mangle for a poem. I'm going to back up. I thought that was your poem. I'm going to make an apology first. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm going to do a reprise here of um, Die Frelle. And um, I'll, I'll give you the, uh, I'll recite the, uh, read the English version first. And then the German. And then the German. So that we get an idea of the meaning. I do, what I notice in... in in trying to learn to recite this, is that how beautiful the German language is. For poetry particularly. Yeah. Lyric poetry. Yeah. Mm. Okay, the trap. In a clear stream, there shot in happy haste the cheerful trout, passed like an arrow. I stood on the bank and watched in sweet calm the bath of the happy fish in the clear stream. An angler with the rod was indeed standing on the bank and looking cold-bloodedly at the way the fish turned. As long as the clear water, I thought, was not disturbed, he will never catch the trout with his fishing rod. However, suddenly the thief was tired of waiting. He made the stream cunningly muddy, and sooner than I thought, his rod jerked. The little fish was twisting on it, and I with hot blood, looked at the victim of the trick. Those of you who at the golden fount of safe, safe youth linger, remember the trap. When you see the danger, hurry. Usually you lack wisdom. Girls, watch the juices with the fishing rod. Otherwise, you will bleed too late. Oh. <laughs> oh, read the last line again. <laughs> read the last line yes, again. Yes, this, this fourth stance is usually often left out. Very gothic, isn't it? Yeah, that? it is. Oh, dear. Let's see if I can get, get it here. It's a bit like difficult. Ooh, how Germanic. <laughs> usually, this is of the, the youth, usually you lack wisdom. Girls, watch the juices with the fishing rod. Otherwise, you will bleed too late. <laughs> and we've been out of the trap for three or four Die Frelle. In einen Becklein heller, da schuss und froher Eil. Die Lonisch Frelle, worüber wie ein Fahr. Ich stand um Dom gestada und sah um Susseru. Das Munten Fisches Bader in Clarem Becklein zu. Ein Fischer mit der Rute wohl an dem Ufer stand und saß mit kaltem Blute, wie sich das Fischlein warnt. So lang dem Wasser heller, so dat ich nicht gebriet, so fand ich die Freller mit seiner Angel nicht. Doch prostig vor dem Dieber, der sich zu lang ermacht, das Becklein tukisch trüber und er ist, ist gedacht. So sucht sein Ruter 
das Fischlein seppelt da, und ich mit regen Blutter sah die betrogen an. Mm. Mm. Die Haar und goldenen Keller der sicken jungen Welt denkt doch an die Freller, se i Gefahr so alt. Meist fällt ihm nur aus Mango, Mango, der Klugheit Matschen zu, der Fufa mit der Angel, sonst blutet ich sag's ab. Interesting. Svensson, very great, and thank you, well read. All right. Mention, James, mention that in Grafton in the 1890s, upwards of 900 people spoke German. Okay. That's a lot of No one knows that, but it's... So, on that note, um, I'd like to invite Gabrielle up. That's a big German input. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just joking, I didn't know that. Yeah, very few people know that. The history books say upwards of 900 people spoke German at Grafton in 1890. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, with that precedent, I think next time I'll bring a couple of my favourite Russian ones. <laughs> One by Masorsky. Can you read them in both? Yeah. English and Russian. <laughs> oh, oh <laughs> next week I'll make sure I'm here. Tonight, just um, one, and um, I chose it before I came. Um, for no particular reason, but with all this fish talk going around, including the last one, it turns out to be quite appropriate. So this is about fish, called Border Control. The oceans swarm with life of every colour. Clownfish, lionfish, Picasso fish and silver sharks. Corals of a thousand different shapes and textures. A different planet, not confined to green. When I was five, I began to love that world. I kept tanks of neon, zebras, angels, Siamese fighters of blue or red or green, leopard catfish and rainbow sheen gouramis, always planning to swim amongst them someday. Watching Cousteau films eagerly and jealously, scrutinizing color prints in library, fish keeping books, mm -hmm. as life stacked up sometimes too strict and heavy. My spirit lightened at the sight of an aquarium, the harmonious grace and serenity of a well-farmed fish tank. Mm. How much more pacific must it be in the ancestral home? When I was 51, I went to Fiji and took a scuba diving course, passed the written test, then went out for the practical, compressing 46 years of anticipation into one hour. <laughs> So I hit the water, kitted up, but asthma hit me. I had to get back on board, gasping, my new sub-aqua camera unused. I looked at the sea like Moses looked at Canaan. The great tin tank, much fuller of oxygen than my bronchitic lungs ever were. And as my Japanese shipmates one by one emerged from communion with turtles and seahorses, they threw their gear onto the cabin floor and from thick plastic waterproof pocket boxes they each extract and light a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> well oh, magic. All right. <laughs> well, on that note, I think I'm going to um, invite Gladys Wilson up. And I was interested how it started to rain. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Australian Poultry Hall of Fame. It's lovely to have you in here, and our group is increasing. Um, this is one I wrote a little while back, about an old clock. Uh, I've run, done one since then, uh, The Spirit of the Bush, and I'll finish last week, and then I've got one coming up on the, an old rocking chair. But this is the eight-day clock. 
This eight-day clock had remained silent over 30 years or more when found amongst all the clutter inside this second-hand bookstore. Many years had gone by, yet the clock still stands alone in chain with dust and spider webs now covering that carved our wooden frame. A couple of writers passing through had decided to stay and went browsing in the shop on a very cold winter's day. With so much joy and excitement could not contain themselves while gazing at those pile of books left scattered on the shelves. But strange things were about to happen like nothing ever before when hello came this little voice from behind an old glass door. The two froze for a moment then could not believe their eyes as the clock soon appeared, much to their surprise. My friends, do not fear. As you can plainly see, I'm the only one in here. I know that you must think of me looking such a disgrace once I lived in comfort alongside the human race. Now the couple were awakened around about midnight as the mansion took in terror from a terrible fright. As daylight came, no one seemed to be aware of a clock ticking away inside in the away in the hallway beside the special alarm chair. <laughs> Gabriel to read it some night. Be good in his voice, in Gabriel's voice. Thank you, Gladys Wilson. Gladys Wilson's an up-and-coming poet of 2021 here at the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame. Um, I'm going to invite Paul up next and save the best to last, obviously, Steve Wordsmith, our old mate, who's coming in tonight. He always puts on a great show. So, Paul, come on up. Thanks, T. Claire. Good to see you again. Good to see the poets. Um, just on that uh, great narration, um, the Schubert songs of the day, especially Gretchen and the Spinning Wheel, were the equivalent of pop songs of that time. Uh, great piano pieces for students. Uh, I've got to say, Billy's uh, speech was wonderful. His poetry was beautiful. He's got a great speaking voice. You should be a, a voiceover man or an answer. Mm -hmm. That's what I did in Tasmania. <laughs> <laughs> Where's that? <laughs> now, now, tonight I, I was sort of running a bit dry on sentimental, crying bluegrass songs. And I was sort of dipped into, as I said to Suzanne, the shallow and somewhat cheesy bucket of the uh, of uh, country music. <coughs> I don't really know this song so very well, so... I might hesitate, go a bit dry, if it's okay with you, good friends, mm -hmm. and uh, I might have to make a few words because I don't really know the words either. <laughs> <laughs> Who does? <laughs> well, well, they're out there in the ether, actually, if I can just attract them. <coughs> like beautiful moss, aren't they? Um, this song is sort of a bit of a weird song because. Uh, Again, it's a ballad, it's a story in a song, and it's uh, food for thought. <clears throat> and this song um, is called Jethro. Old Jethro, you know he went crazy. We all get crazy at times. They fixed up his lungs and his fever, but they couldn't fix up his mind. He married a beautiful redhead. Of women they said she's a pearl She gave her heart to Jethro And a body to the whole damn world Now Jethro's got someone to talk to They were monsters and little green men But he never spoke to his woman He spent all his time with his friends In the evening she'd drive off and leave him She'd toss back her long pretty curls She gave her heart to Jethro and a body to the whole damn world. Her friends came and begged her to leave him. They said Jethro belongs in a home. She said, I gave my heart to Jethro, but my God-given body's my own. Now some of her lovers were strangers. She gave everybody a world. She gave her heart to Jethro, and a body to the whole damn world. <laughs> now some people will condemn me for sin. A song about a man and his wife. 
But a man's got to see what he relates to the things that he comes up in life. Now some people will condemn me for cursing. But much can be said for the girl who gave her heart to Jethro and her body to the whole damn world. <laughs> W-H-I-R-L. <laughs> Before I get Steve Wordsmith up here. Well done, Paul. Thank you very much. <laughs> so this one was written five years ago-ish, uh, and a bit more on the 16th of January, five years and three days ago. 2017. Um, and I was in, um, where was I? I was in the Numanbar Valley near kind of natural bridge, natural arch in uh, the Gold Coast hinterlands. And I was on the edge of the matrix and there was only sort of like one bar of 3G kind of place. So it was just a lot of time in just nature. And it was all rainforest. And see, if you don't know that place, it's between two plateaus. On one side, you've got the Lamington Plateau, which is all um, subtropical rainforest. And on the other side, you've got Springbrook um, Plateau. And you're sort of down in this valley, and it's all huge trees and like flowing streams and stuff. It's got no title. <coughs> Surrounded by paradise of rainforest mountains, a symphony of frogs, and a creek like a fountain. Walking in two worlds, the carpet and the dirt, sometimes bare-chested, there's other times in a shirt. Nature is nature. Won't go away, but cities crumble and wash into the bay. There's thunderclouds coming, sweeping over the shore, and humans live with nature once more. Thundercloud, lightning, spelling a wonderful spell, the rainbows are coming, and it's good way, goodbye and good riddance to the old hell. The rainbows are all walking, holding hands, making a thunderstorm, changing the land. And the frogs sing together. And the leaves prick up to thundercloud tears, rain joy over me and you. Bravo. Raining now, and it's happening that we're in the biggest rainfall event for Australia for at least the last 10 years. Like, big rain. And they're like, that's just awesome. I love it. Where were you when you actually wrote that? In natural, in, in the valley of Numanbar Valley, up near um, Germain Greer's place where she's got where like you this actually wrote it. It's very yeah. powerful. Mm. Oh yeah, there's like That's big like one. trees and there's yeah, like yeah, big yeah, rocks yeah. and beautiful creeks and places to swim mm -hmm. and stuff and and yeah big thunderstorms coming over all the time because it was this time of year, January, when you get that that happens there yeah, all the time. That's where the damage on Lismore comes from. When you get the big heavy storms about three kilometres to the west of there it comes down in a watershed on the Wilson down onto Mount Lismore and nearly wipes it out. Okay. Mm. Mm. So it really does change <laughs> landscapes. Yeah. All right, before I invite, the, the grandfather picks you up. <laughs> is, is, is that your dildo? No, it's not. No, no, the, the not. giraffe. This is Julius Giraffe. He's the flying giraffe. He's also, he's many things. He's... He's got a series of poetry written about him. One is a ninja, one he drives, it goes across. Well, anyway, you'll hear about him. In a little forest lived a joyous little pixie 
who wore a green felt hat and was named Trixie. Trixie loved to tell jokes and make people laugh with amusing anecdotes about a flying giraffe and how the giraffe looped the loop and landed down, parachuting down and landing on the ground. And after how the giraffe even got more trickier riding a motorcycle Harley all the way across Antarctica. And then how the giraffe trained to become a ninja and drank green tea and ate vegetables and ginger and then fought a bully, Shaolin Elephant, defeated the elephant and became triumphant. Now, Trixie the Pixie, who lived in the forest, was a world famous poet. Yes, one of the best. Because Trixie was happy and would never grumble when Trixie was funny, cute, but also humble. One day Trixie went out walking in the street and just per chance Trixie happened to meet a wingsuit flying monocycle Harley riding ninja giraffe. Trixie the Pixie was gobsmacked oh, and had a laugh. <laughs> mm. I'm going to invite Steve up here. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. What some wonderful poets here tonight, eh? It's always good to see fresh new faces around the place. I love to be in the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame, and it's good of James to set this place up to celebrate the poetry of the past. There is magic in the mountains with the Aussie sounds around us as we travel through the universe and we thrive here in nature as Mother Earth supplies with the waters from the mountain springs and the sounds of birds as they sing and the gentle breeze just whispering <coughs> a lovely lullaby. When the fire burns around us and the forests are ablaze and the smoke is so thick and you can't see through the haze and the anguish of the hurt and the loss of the affected in its path. Through many trials and hardships throughout this southern land, as the devastation spreads and the virus comes to bear. There is a time of gathering while the crew are slowly mustering and the instruments are turned up to make that special vibe. Yes, the magnetism is magic, not bound by the illusion and the outside world's confusion as we open up our eyes. Yes, we open up our real eyes and we realise the, the truth that have been told. So we live here in abundance with the Aussie sounds around us, with the orchestra of nature, and we find our place in the symphony, tried by virus, fire and floods and hardships and the spirit of this southern land really comes alive. Mm -hmm. Really good to be here. I love being in the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame. What a place to be, eh? And it's love to see audiences and people that I haven't seen their faces before. See, I'm known in many places of this country, all over the, the place, for the poetry that I do, the stories that I tell, the places that I wander throughout this fabulous land as we travel. I am known in many places by many names, one of them being the maker of magic and the weaver of dreams. I make dreams come in the words that I speak and the things that happen and the change of magic. People say to me, do you do magic? I say, yes, all the time. They say, do as an illusion. Do as a trick. I said, no, that's the illusion. That's the illusion. Magic is understanding the delusions of life. When you open up your real eyes to realise the real eyes and realise the real lies, there's many real lies to be found in this country and in this world where we walk. We as poets have the ability to be the voice and to project the words that we see and the truths that we hear in the things that we say. The, the poets of the past have written many things and we've seen the history of this country come alive. People say, where does a place like me come from? 
See, I was brought up in the country in a place called Wedderburn, on the side of the Georges River with the stags and the elks and the ferns. There wasn't many luxuries, no, things weren't very plush, but we had this long drop dummy called the orifice of the bush. <laughs> There's one thing that I know for sure, and I spent a lot of time just doodling in the dirt there, and I even wrote some rhyme. A place to fantasize and figure out, but everything was true. I hide out from the washing up like young lads often do. I'd always lift the lid up to avoid a bit of fright, to eradicate the chances of the dreaded red back bite. <laughs> like mum's old chook, I'd settle in with me pants around me knees, to the sound of the neighbour's rampant ball and fruit bats in the trees. Like a medieval king, I'd sit upon his gilded throne, my favourite place, I must admit, in our lovely country home. Yes, I'm a connoisseur of dunnies. Of this it is a fact, a place to try, a place to check, before I hang my hat. I remember when I left the bush in a council house in town, there was an outhouse out the back, yeah, a place to settle down. It wasn't quiet as our country home, but it had all the mods and cons. Running water, electric light, and an oven to cook scones. I'd only been there a week when, when I awoke with an awful fright. There was a shadow past the window in the middle of the night. I'd heard about these prowlers and their low-down thieving tricks. But they'd taken on the wrong bloke this time, this lad from out the sticks. Well, I hit the floor running. There wasn't time to put on clothes. I'll get that flaming larrikin and I'll probably break his nose. Through the front door quietly, the blood was pumping fast. I'd stop him at the gate, I thought, as the bare feet hit the grass. He was running up the footpath with his booty on his back. I'd played rugby in my school days and I'd stop him in his track. Well, I hit him round the ankles and he had nowhere to go. Yeah, I dropped him like a dunny lid and all he said was, No! The smell was something awful. I'd never live it down. I'd nail the poor old dunny man and I dropped him on the ground. The ex he dropped it. <laughs> <laughs> Drop the flame alone, and right across the grass he dropped the flame. These things happen. <laughs> the stories, we have many stories that he tell. And, you know, I tell a story, and, and I came to grief not too long ago, because I tell this story, and it's a, a, a really interesting story about a very, very heroic character and I tell it all the time and I'm down in the middle of the hotel the other day and I <laughs> tell this story I'm right in the middle it broke I couldn't remember it <laughs> and I just thought well there you go I met him first near Warren working on a starved out farm he was skeletor and sallow lean of shank and long of arm Wide lips and flared out nostrils that bespoke his native blood. Battler, scratching hard existence in this land of drought and flood. But he won a tight survival, chasing rabbits day and night. Had no gun, no ammunition. Used to knock him out and fight with a waddy for a weapon. Junk or rock was just the same. And he'd grab that groggy bunny and he'd say, that was deadly, young. Mean. Sell them off his target, gave those speelers a little rest in them knock em sock em alleys in the showground out the, the west. The day that I enlisted, he was standing next to me, and I heard him tell the captain that his name was Darkie Lee. Or oh, often quiet and moody, lonely in a crowd, no doubt, or perhaps a dip of colour made him feel the odd man out. But he was a willing soldier, and had dinkum him cobber too, like the night the M Peace quarters at that swy game in the loo. Yeah, he nailed that probat sergeant cold as any side of meat with a well-aimed whiskey bottle at the range of 20 feet. Mighty quick we were escaping and I heard our mate exclaim as we scarpered through the alleys. Fellas, that was deadly aim. Then our mob embarked for service to a land across the sea to the final call awaited for that bloke called Darkie Lee. It was at the Flanders dust-up at a place called Blardner's Court we copped a bad position. Yeah, men cut off without support. And that enemy machine gun keeping up a steady fire, safe and sound in their encampment behind barricade and wire. 
flat where you lay like bloody lizards on that piece of shell rake plane and that enemy machine gun pelted lead like summer rain. Well, our choice was die like heroes or the white surrender flag. When our officer decided it was time to sky the rag, take your choice, a German prison or a group of unmarked mounds. When this bloke goes racing past me like a hare before the hounds strike me blue, but it was darky. Like an emu crouching low, in his right hand was a grenade swinging ready for the throw. No cover to protect him, dashing daring as you please. Where those Mitchell houses chattered and the bullets hummed like bees. And fair into that enemy gun pit, he dispatched his first grenade. Screams were heard from brave men dying as that scarlet blossom burst. Then he sent them up another just as quickly as the first, German gunner or rabbit. It was all the same to our champion Bundy Chucker. He maintained his deadly aim. Then a dying spurt of gunfire rang the bell on Dark Lee. By the time the medics got there, he was very nearly gone. Though his belly parts were punctured, his heart was hanging on. And in final grief, we listened to the gasps that shook his frame. And the final words he uttered, fellas, that was deadly. <laughs> Just another unsung hero, but I'm hollowed and unsung. One of many number when the final curtain rung. Native son with small ambition, or oh, our hearts decree, a soldier in the true tradition, rest untroubled, that you lead. Yeah. That was the one that I broke down right in the middle of. <laughs> so these, these people or patrons of this hotel got half the story and then Darky Lee, the spirit of Darky Lee said, that's enough, that's enough. So I have a good friend which is uh, Wirodjuri, he's an artist around the place that we see every now and then and he just came in and backed up. So it was the spirit of Darky Lee just came in and finished it off. So that was really nice. <laughs> so, and I will finish off with just another little story of, of uh, the bush or a couple of shearing stories. There once was a shearer by the name of Bluey the Brink. He was a devil for work and a devil for drink. He could shear his 200 a day without fear and drink without winking four gallons of beer. Now Jimmy the barman who served out the drink, he just hated the sight of here, Bluey the Brink. He stayed much too late and he came much too soon in the morning and the night and the daytime and at noon. Well, one day when Jimmy was cleaning the bar with sulfuric acid that he kept in a jar, mm. old Bluey come yelling, I'm bawling with thirst. Whatever you've got, Jim, just give me the first. Well, it ain't in the histories and it ain't put in print, but Bluey drank acid with never a stint. Said, that's the stuff, Jimmy, will strike me stone dead. That'll make me the ringer of Stevenson's shed. Well, all that long day as he served out the beer, poor Jimmy was worried with his troubles and fear. Too worried to argue, too anxious to fight. All he could see was his corpse in his fright. Well, early next morning as he opened the door, along came the shearer, he was yelling for more. With his eyebrows all singed and his whiskers deranged and holes in his hide like a dog with the mange. Said Jimmy, and how'd you like that new stuff? Said Blue Ears, fine, but ain't it enough? It gave me great courage to shear and to fight. But every cough set me whiskers alight. I thought a new drink, but I must have been wrong, for what you gave me was proper and strong. It set me to coffin, and you know I'm no liar, but every cough set my whiskers on fire. <laughs> ten, years, ten years ago, I got the opportunity to... Uh, represented World Expo for Australian communities and some of the uh, things that we've learned over this time and this period when there was no stories being told or no poetry at that time being actually voiced. There's plenty of poets, there's lots, but nobody was actually verbalising poetry. So when I got to go there, you know, you've got 10,000 people around you and you've got to speak. And I wasn't really a poet at that time, but you'd come up with things where you travelled. Near the rambling Richmond River where the ghosts of cedar barges rise from derelicts and skeletons to tales of years gone by. Of the early cedar cutters who braved the coastal ranges to reap the value to harvest at the massive forest side. 
But the years have passed so quickly, and the banks are now near barren through the mighty Richmond Valley from Nashua down to Korokai. And the river's seldom used now for transport or for pleasure. And the water's brown and mud-stained as the land gives up the fight. From years of torrential downpours has caused the land erosion and floods that stole the topsoil that the big scrub held in place. Where once there was an abundance of the fighting Richmond black bass, now from the murky muddy waters comes the catfish and the eel. Yes, the Richmond's only one place in this wondrous world around us. The man has taken over and he's stirred the flaming pot. But he'll reap his just desert so when he plays with Mother Nature and she says the game's now over and she starves the bloody lot. Mm. <laughs> we tell many tales and many stories and, and poet, what is poetry? Poetry is thought written down. We all have opinions, there's many opinions around and, and there's so many conflicting opinions at the moment and it's difficult to see this truth when we, when we see all sorts of inadequate, inappropriate wording being put forward. And as Australian poets, we have a great privilege to be able to take out words and to be able to present truths in whatever we see, in whatever way. It's good that we celebrate the, the past and the, the poets of the past. There's many good poems being brought out at the moment, I write lots of poems myself, I'm working on my second book, my first book is where the rubber hits the road in this game they call life, I do have a copy of it around somewhere, it's available from the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame, it's also available in 2500 bookshops across the world, it's on e-books and it tells my early poetry, I'm working on my second one which is my autobiography and I uh, hope to have that ready soon. Thank you, James. Mm -hmm. Okay. Steve Wood, Steve, thank you very much. Now, um, Steve has recently written um, a bit of poetry about the Gyra Ghost. And um, have you got Steve's book here? Yeah, I'll just... Steve's, Steve's book there for the people out on in the TV land. Um, where the rubber hits the road in this game, they call life available here at the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame. Just like this Disobey sticker, which is one of mine as well. Um, and also, um, Gyra Ghost postcards and Gyra Ghost rocks. Mm -hmm. And Steve, as I said, wrote a poem about the Gyra Ghost, which, um, yeah, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. But 101 years ago, there was a ghost in Gyra and a poltergeist, and rocks flew to house and stuff <coughs> like that. Anyway, enough of that. Um, this is called Disobedience. Um, it's something my mum used to read to me when I was like a little tiny boy by A. <coughs> a. a. Milne. And he's the fella that wrote Winnie the Pooh, and that bunch of books. And um, she probably read it to me because my name's James. <laughs> now, I thought, oh, one of these days I'm going to go back and read it. So I read it and I was looking at it and I'm thinking, hang on, she didn't tell me this last bit. <laughs> like, because it's quite gory. You're like, well, not really. Like, it doesn't, you've got to leave it up to your imagination here. So anyway, I'll read you out A.A. Milne's poem, and then I'll read you out the happy ending that I wrote for it, because it gets pretty sad. It's called Disobedience. James, James, Morrison, Morrison, oh. whether be George Dupree, took great care of his mother, although he was only three. James, James said to his mother, mother, he said, said he, you must never go down to the end of town without, if you don't go down with me. James, James Morrison's mother put on a golden gown. James, James Morrison's mother drove to the end of town. James, James Morrison's mother said to herself, said she, I can get right down to the end of town and be back in time for tea. King John put up a notice 
lost, stolen, or strayed. James James Morrison's mother seems to have been mislaid. Last seen vaguely walking, wandering vaguely, quite of her own accord, she tried to get down to the end of the town. Forty shillings reward. James James Morrison Morrison, commonly known as Jim, told his other relations not to go blaming him. James James said to his mother, Mother, he said, said he, You must never go down to the end of town without consulting me. James James Morrison's mother hasn't been heard of since. King John said he was sorry. So did the Queen and the Prince. King John, somebody told me, said to a man he knew, if people go down to the end of town, well, what can anyone do? J, J, M, M. W.G. Dupuy took great care of his mother, although he was only three. J. J. said to his mother, Mother, he said, said he, you must never go down to the end of town without consulting me. But it didn't end there. <laughs> Things picked up quite substantially. James James Morrison Morrison Weatherby George Dupree said to his mummy, Don't go out. Please do not disobey me. James James Morrison said, Mummy, please don't go out. You might get eaten by a monster. I hear there's monsters about. A monster ate my mummy. One day when she was out, she went down to the bank to get some money out. Monster ate my money. She didn't make any noise. She was at the ATM behind some other little boys. A monster ate my mummy. Wasn't really fair. I think it was because my mummy has such colourful hair. A monster ate my mummy and I just wanted my mummy back. So I'm going monster hunting. And down that monster, our oh, track. <laughs> a monster ate my mummy, and this is what I did in a tree beside the ATM. I climbed it and I hid. A monster ate my mummy. I jumped upon its back and I cracked the monster open and I got my mummy back. <laughs> monster ate my mummy, and I said to my mummy, you must never go down to the ATM if you don't take me. Because a monster ate you, mummy, and it wasn't in my head I uncut you from a monster's guts. James, James, Morrison, Morrison, Weatherby, George Dupree said. Mummy, mummy. Mummy, yeah. Mm. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight to the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame. Thank you to everybody out there in the virtual world. Paul, Gabrielle, visitors, Ashley, Dark, Bill, Gladys, Steve, and Mark, and... Um, the Nobbit. Yep. And the Nobbit, yeah. The, <laughs> the High Plains <laughs> Nobbit that we started. And Kevin Gilbert, whose poetry I read, that read out first. And um, just to show you all... Mm. We've got see Gyra Ghost Rocks here. These are not exactly the rocks that the ghost was throwing at the house in Gyra. Well, because these ones are made here on the site, <laughs> handmade by by her over there, and put together on this Gyra Ghost Rocks. And the same as this um, this Australian Poetry Hall of Fame children's T-shirt designed by yours truly, mm. and um, 
and this is what I was on ABC Radio about this morning, the guy who goes postcards. Woo. So, yeah. On Tamworth Radio, really. On Tamworth, yeah, ABC <laughs> New England. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Um, and we've also got um, Australian Poetry Hall of Fame stubby holders at the moment. Anyway, but that's it for now. Thank you. If you're that's online, great. if you like it, subscribe, give it a thumms up. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I thought we were going to thank um, the three W's.